Hey folks, my name is Adam and I like to make tiny nerdy things, and I spent this last week playing a little low-budget indie game called God of War Ragnarok, or something like that, and there's one character in particular who caught my attention. Thick Thor, the God of Thunder Thighs. Now anytime I try to create a human portrait, I tend to end up with a seriously oversized head. Today, to combat that, I'm going to try something a little bit different, and I'm going to make his head first. Starting with the head serves two main purposes, the first being that making the head first, I can build the rest of the body to suit the size of my noggin. What I usually do when I make a head is I measure the correct size of the head for the body, then I continue to build up the cheekbones and brow ridges and fatten up the jowls and lengthen the jaw until my original head is roughly twice the size of what I'd started with. By making the head first, it doesn't really matter how big my head is, since I can just make the body to match whatever random scale I end up with by the time the face is finished. Now the second, and I think significantly more important reason, is that heads are hard and making a head look even remotely like what I want it to at a small scale is something that I find exceptionally challenging. By starting with a head, I'm still fresh and full of enough confidence and optimism to keep me going when after four hours my sculpture looks less like the God of Thunder and more like Sloth from the Goonies. It also works as a means to test the water for a project, and gauge whether it's something I actually want to spend more time working on, or if I'd rather just rage quit and move on to a project that I can make super weird and intentionally bad, and then just slap, but it's realistic, in the title. Otherwise, my head gets baked and locked in place, and I can take it back to the body and start building the bones. Now, the bones, of course, are made of painter's tape and aluminium, as all easier bones are, and then wound in a bit of itty-bitty wire to keep it all in place. Then I can stick it onto a little wooden sculpting block and attach the head to the body. A quick lateral raise to lift his arms and I can start bulking out the majority of his ample girth with copious amounts of aluminium foil. Once I've got a girthy, shiny, thick boy, I'll take a minute to give him a mean lean and then reposition his arms before I get to adding the initial layer of fleshy clay. Now, I don't know much about this game, but I guess it's probably a good thing that it's just a small indie company that made it, since I can't imagine Disney would be very happy about them stealing their original Marvel character, Thor. Disney is notorious for enforcing copyright, but I guess they were able to get around that by using the fat version, rather than a more immediately recognizable cloud version. Of course, this all works in my favor though, since it means that instead of having to meticulously sculpt each of those overblown six-pack abs, I can instead focus all my attention on the single keg that is his most distinguishing central feature. A central feature which, much like his head, will act as a scale that I can build the rest of his body around, and once the proportions are in place, I can start adding the finer details. That being said though, apart from his belly and his back, the majority of Thor is covered in layer upon layer of armor, so I'm not too worried about how perfect the detail is. Now, better people than me would probably sculpt a perfectly proportioned, muscled, and toned body underneath, and then add the armor on top, but that feels like a lot of extra work and I'm not really into that. Instead, I'm going for that stretch arm strong level of body detail. That way, despite how it turns out in the end, you'll all know that underneath the detailed and intricate armor lies an amorphous fleshy blob. Otherwise, my pink god dad bod gets a once over with isopropyl alcohol to smooth out the lumps and it's into the oven to bake. However, once I got him out of the oven, I realized this would be my last chance to run some LEDs if I wanted to add lighting later, so I cut a couple channels in his sides and ran the necessary subcutaneous wiring. I had this vision of Thor with lightning crackling on his fingertips, but I hadn't quite figured out how I wanted that to work, and I figured it would be better to have the wiring in place and not need it, versus trying to add it after the fact. I'll embed a teeny tiny LED into the palm of his right hand, then solder a larger LED onto the belt of his left side, where I imagine Mjolnir will be hanging. Once his electrical veins have been hidden under the skin, I can start to add his hands. Now, one of the things I really like about this particular version of Thor is that he's got these great big sausage fingers, which makes my job a lot easier since they're significantly less finicky than if he had much daintier little fingers. Of course, Thor is also a god known for punching his way out of most predicaments, so I think I can probably get away with making his knuckles look extra gnarly. As far as how his hands are positioned, I figured the best thing to do would just be to use my own hand as reference. I decided that I wanted Thor's left hand to be hovering over Mjolnir, which will be strapped to his belt, and I'll position his fingers in such a way that it's clear he brought a hammer to a gunfight. 
Finally, I'll solder the aforementioned LED onto the wires, then pull the excess wiring down his leg until the bulb is sitting neatly on his hip. Otherwise, that's his fleshy torso finished and he's ready for some clothes. Now, Thor is very much rocking that autumnal layered styling, which means he's got a lot of pieces stacked one on top of the other. So to get his lower body started, I'm going to give him a stylish pair of black cutoffs, followed by a pair of equally stylish knee-high leather boots. A slew of oversized wormy dealy stuck onto his cutoffs will help give the impression of being tucked into the boots. Then I can add some easy texture by pressing a piece of textured fabric onto the clay. I've rolled out an extra long, extra wormy brown wormy dealy, then squished it flat so that I can wrap it around his boots. The top of the boot gets a wider, flatter worm of clay to make the separation between the boots and the trousers more obvious. Then I can add a last bit of detail to his shoes before moving on to subsequent layers of clothing. Just above his pants and below his first of many skirts, Thor has a few fancy tassels that hang down, so I'm going to make those out of a thin sheet of dark blue clay, then stick them onto his crotch and both butt cheeks. Next comes the first of his skirts, with the bottom one being only visible in between the separations of the top layers, so I only really need to make the small section in front. I'm going to be making all of the pieces of armor separately, then attaching them to Thor, and by sculpting it all on a plastic sheet, I can be sure that it won't stick to my table when it comes time to peel it off and add it to the model. A fair amount of the armor that Thor wears is embossed with swirls and runes and whatnot, but trying to make the intricate level of detail on each piece of leather makes my balls itch. So instead, you'll see me trying a slew of different methods to fake it. All in all, I think most of them work out pretty well, as long as you're willing to commit to the more is more method of detail. This has always been one of my preferred methods for adding detail to a model, since it relies heavily on just adding so much stuff that you haven't really got enough time to focus on any one thing in particular. Eventually, your eyes just start to glaze over, and everything looks blurry enough that you don't notice any of the slew of minor issues. Now at this point I've got the first layer of his lower body finished and I'm working on adding the bottom layer of his upper body before it all goes into the oven to lock the details in place. Now once I take it out of the oven I decided that his chest wasn't looking saggy enough for my liking so I'll give him a quick chop chop so that I have a nice fresh surface to rebuild a much more impressive set of moves on top of. The first iteration was a bit too perky for my liking whereas I think this set of bro breasts has a much more convincing looking sag. Now with his chest looking much better I can get back to building up the layers. Same as before, I'll start with the bottom, however this time I'm going to completely finish his lower half before getting started on his upper body. Now the main section of his skirt is a weathered worn brown leather wrap that gets wrapped all the way around his waist then followed by a similar but smaller embossed black leather wrap. He's got a couple cross stitched leather hip huggers that help keep his muffin top in place then it all gets held together with a slew of brown and black leather belts. Now, being a god, any of the metallic bits on his belts and his various accoutrements are of course made of gold, but I don't have any gold clay, so instead I'll make it all out of yellow clay, which should make it much easier to do the painting later on. Finally, a bit of extra muffin top support, followed by his big final boss double stitched belt in the middle. This of course needs its own set of over the top gaudy golden accessories. Last but not least, I decided his backside was a bit bare, so I added a couple of attachments for his belt to make it a little bit more interesting. A little leather coin purse, a hardened leather pouch, and of course because he's a Norse god, a hardy wooden stein. To start on his upper body, I made his little golden circlet and attached it with a tiny section of a leather thong, thinking that the majority of it would be hidden by his armor anyways, but I'll end up removing it and remaking the strap later. Then I can add the rest of his shoulder padding, followed by the first of three sets of leather pauldrons. The bottom layer is the least visible, so it gets rudimentary details, but I'll make sure to take my time and add lots of details to the other two sections, since they'll be right out front and very obvious. Because the clay is a little stretchy, I can pull the pauldrons until they fit perfectly, add a couple little extra leathery plates onto the tips, then add the topmost section of the shoulder armor. Some teeny tiny black wormy dealies tied into fake knots will be the 
well, fake knots, and then I can redo the aforementioned necklace strap before adding some fancy wrist guards. Then the wrist guards are held together with a couple brown leather straps with more shiny golden buckles. Otherwise, the only thing left to add will be his long flowing red locks. However, before I do that, I want to get the majority of his details painted onto his face since it'll be a lot easier to do that before his hair's in place. I'll get the most visible part of his tattoo in place while little squiggles should suffice for the rest since it'll basically be invisible. Then I can give him some piercing blue eyes with equally piercing black irises, add some darker shading in and around the eyes in his various wrinkles, then I can paint on his eyebrows before getting to work building up his beard and his hair. Now it's definitely kind of a bummer to see this bald boy go, but at least I'm going to work in stages so you get to see him develop a proper beard, then grow a mustache before finally sprouting a ridiculously beautiful head of red hair. Now with his hair in place, that's our mighty thick Thor finished and ready for painting. However, before I get to that, I need to talk about his lightning hands. Sadly, I tried a few different methods to make use of his Iron Man palm laser, but I couldn't figure out a way that didn't look silly, so eventually, I just had to accept defeat and scab them over. And with that, it's time to paint. Now I'll start where anyone else would and paint those nipples a bit darker before getting the creases of his exposed fleshy bits with a fleshy red wash before getting to work on his tattoos. Now Thor's got a lot of tattoos and I'm gonna treat them with the same care and attention to detail that I gave the leather embossing. Which is to say that I'm gonna slap a whole bunch of haphazard squiggles and shapes in place, but do so much of it that unless you're really paying attention, you probably won't notice how much of a mess it actually is. For the rest of the painting, I'm gonna be using almost exclusively heavy washes over top. I like to treat the colored clay like a base coat or a really simple paint by numbers that tells me exactly what color goes where. It's also really handy because it means that I don't need to worry about getting into every nook and cranny since if I miss painting one of the brown sections brown, well, I mean, it's still brown, it's just not the same color of brown. Now once I've gone over all the sections with their color appropriate heavy washes, I'll come back through with my opaque metal colors to add the shiny details. For Thor, that really only means painting everything that's yellow with an opaque gold. Once it's all had a chance to dry, I'll give everything a wash of thin black to dull all the surfaces, add extra recess shading to all the cracks and creases, and help tie all the pieces together. Finally, a final once over with the dry brush to tickle all the tips with a spattering of lighter shades to help highlight the edges and bring back a bit of the sharpness. And with that, Thor is all but finished, except of course he's missing a pretty important part of his ensemble. Now with the main body of Mjolnir made, I can drill a couple holes for a handle and for a mount, then start to add the detail. By making the main body first and baking it, it'll be a lot easier to carve the finer surface details without messing up the shape. Also, the extra coarse sandpaper gives the clay a pretty terrific accidental hammer texture that was totally planned all along. Once I've marked out my golden dots, I can start to lay out my Mjolnir appropriate engraving. The cling film helps to cut the design into the clay without pushing the clay around too much, leaving me with sharp, clean lines. Then I can squish some little golden balls into my little golden ball holes, add a little engraving, then stick an aluminium handle into my handle hole, and wrap it with wood. Then a series of little golden wormy dealies wrapped strategically around the handle and the base of the head will give me my golden filigree detailing, and then Mjolnir is ready for a silver paint job, some little golden highlights, and a nice black wash to bring out the details. Then I'll use the otherwise useless LED as a mount for Mjolnir before getting to work adding the lightning. What's that? You thought I'd given up on the lightning? Never, I just wasn't sure how best to do it and it wasn't until the very end that I was struck by a bolt of ingenuity. First I'll drill a bunch of barely perceptible holes into Mjolnir and Thor's hands and then run some tiny armature wire that I bent into lightning bolty shapes. Then I'll slowly and carefully cover them in a thin layer of this fancy translucent clay. But this isn't just any old translucent clay. No, this stuff glows in the dark. Now with the hands of lightning and a belly that would make a laughing Buddha jealous, this thick Thor is finished, so all that's left to do is make him a base to stand on. 
Now there's more than a few high quality collector's edition God of War statues out there and they all seem to have similar bases with lots of runic stones surrounding a rocky outcropping. I'm nothing if not a shameless plagiarizer, so that's pretty much what I'm going to try and do here. To make the runic stones, I'll cut a bunch of blocky blocks of foam out of some blocks of foam, then carve some crude Nordic runes into the surface. To make these look a little rougher around the edges and more like actual rocky rocks, I'll toss them all in an empty container with a bunch of real rocks, then shake the shit out of them. These then get glued all willy-nilly around the outside of my rock outcropping, and I can start filling in some of the holes with some hole filler that I've tinted to a dark grey. Once the hole fillers had chance to dry, I'll give the whole base a couple coats of paint starting with a dark grey primer. I'll then follow this with a lighter grey base coat. And to help the stones stand out, I'll give them a slightly different shade. Finally to add a little shading, it'll get a big coat of black wash. Then to add a little bit of contrast and to highlight the edges, I'll work my way through a series of progressively lighter dry brushes. To help the rune stand out and to give it a bit more color, I've mixed up some glow-in-the-dark pigment with a little UV resin which I'll then toothpick into all the runes. Once they cure, they should glow in the dark along with Thor's lightning fingies. Now it's Fimble winter after all, so I'll add some snow to my base starting with a thick coat of untinted white hole filler, which I'll use to build up the bulk of my snow, followed by some much lighter, much snowier fake snow that I'll sprinkle over the top. A quick spritz of ice bubble alcohol followed by a thinned out PVA glue will hold it all in place and once it's dried I can press Thor into place on top and we're onto the glamour shots. As always, a big old thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. You guys are the tits. And a very special shout out to my newest patrons Mindstriker DJ, Alex, Kaiju Ramen Magazine, Meat Boy, Gentle Sana, Jonathan Royer, Perry Spectus, Llama Vices, Roger Stallings, Summer Nights Art, Beautiful Becky Babe, W Bronze, Dak Rug, Corinne Bradley and Daisy Devereaux, Lauren R, Perv Alpha Monkey, Tanya Dixon, Kaza Raw, Kane and Odin, Torby Torbson, Kappa Red, Isaac Burgett, and Lucy. You are the overstretched, underappreciated set of belts that keep this girthy belly of a channel in check. If you like this video, then sweet, right on. Uh, I'm glad. Otherwise, we'll uh, see you next time. Cheers.